Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Milam. I'm the president of the History Society here at ASU. And today we'll be hearing from Dr. Alan Berenberg, the Buena Vista Associate Professor, uh, Buena Vista Foundation, actually, Associate Professor and Associate Chair at the Texas Tech University Department of History. Um, this presentation is sponsored today by the Anna Pasek um, Russian Fund and the Jeanette McWilliams Endowment. Uh, we are also sponsored tonight by the Department of English and Modern Languages, the Dr. Arnaldo de Leon uh, Department of History, the ASU Russian Club, and the ASU History Society. The ASU Russian Enrichment Program and History Lecture Series always hosts events like this and other talks every year. And tonight, the Russian Enrichment Program is proud to be hosting this event with Dr. Berenberg. Dr. Berenberg is the author of the award-winning book, Gulag Town, Company Town, Forced Labor, and Its Legacies in Work. Work Kuta, who could probably say it better than I could, published in 2014, as well as the co-editor of Rethinking the Gulag, Identities, Sources, Legacies, which was published earlier this year. Could probably also give you that title a lot faster than I can. Um, uh, Dr. Berenberg has also received multiple awards for his teaching, including the uh, Texas Tech University President's Excellence in Teaching Award in 2016. Today, he'll be talking to us about the founding of the Soviet Union by the Bolsheviks as the world's first anti-imperialist empire, as much as that doesn't seem correct, its treatments of minorities, and its collapse in 1991. The presentation will also cover some of the legacies left by the Soviet Union today, and we'll also be hearing about how the history of the Soviet Union should impact our understanding of the Russian invasions of Ukraine this year and in 2014, and the invasion of Georgia in 2008. And what all of those could mean concerning the resurrection of a Soviet Union empire. And then, of course, following, there'll be a short Q&A. So everyone, Dr. Alan Berenberg. Thank you very much. I'm very, very glad to be here tonight. Um, really not used to speaking to rooms full of people. It's been a while. I'm not used to speaking into a microphone, but I'm really excited to be here and do this. Um, I want to thank uh, all of the sponsors of this event, uh, in particular the Dr. Arnaldo de Leon Department of History, um, the Angeles State University Russian Club, and History Society, especially to uh, Eva Davis and to uh, Dr. Archer for being very gracious hosts during my, my time here. Um, I'm really happy, really pleased to be back at, at Angela State. So, um, on uh, February 24th, two 2022, Russia launched a massive invasion of neighboring Ukraine on multiple fronts. Although Ukraine repelled multiple prongs of this assault, particularly in its capital city, Kyiv, the war continues more than six months later. Tens of thousands of Ukrainian civilians have been killed, and over six million Ukrainians have been displaced, making this war one of the largest humanitarian crises of the 21st century. Although this is Russia's largest military operation against a neighbor since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, it is hardly the first. For example, in August 2008, Russia fought a brief and decisive conflict with the Republic of Georgia, ostensibly to protect the autonomy of a region called South Ossetia, a region of Georgia that had long been a source of conflict between the two countries. In fact, you know, the, to, to say that Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022 is really not an accurate statement. Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014 and has never left. Um, it simply renewed and greatly expanded uh, the invasion. Uh, so, so it's not really a, a new war at all. Nevertheless, the, the new scale, of course, of this conflict has led commentators to struggle to explain Russian aggression and place it into appropriate context. Why did Putin decide to invade Ukraine, and why did he decide to do it in 2022? How does this war, and other wars, fit into the broader context of relations between Russia and its neighbors, as well as with its NATO adversaries over the past 10, 50, 100 years? Is this renewed Russian imperialism? Should we understand this as a Russian imperial conflict? Is it a sign of Putin's failing health? Is it a rational response to the expansion of NATO, which threatens Russian security? Or is it an attempt to revive the Soviet Union? Which is the question that I would like to tackle today. That is, is, this an attempt to, is Russia's invasion of Ukraine an attempt to revive the Soviet Union? <clears throat> 
The question about the connection between the war and the Soviet Union is particularly timely. We are now on the cusp of the 100th anniversary of the foundation of the Soviet Union coming up in December. 100 years ago, in December 1922, Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks proclaimed the creation of a new state, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or Soviet Union. Some five years after they had taken power in the Russian revolutions of 1917, and at, at the conclusion of a bloody civil war that they fought against domestic and foreign foes, the Bolsheviks announced the creation of a new polity, one unlike any that the world had ever known, which I'll talk more about. Although it changed in some important and dramatic ways, this new empire lasted until December 1991, when it collapsed in very undramatic fashion, because the many parts of the Union, including Russia, decided to strike it out alone as independent countries. So in my talk today, I'd like to do two things. First, I wanna talk about what the Soviet Union was and what made it different from all other empires that came before it, including the Russian Empire. Then I'd like to explore briefly a second question. Is Russia's current invasion of Ukraine an attempt to rebuild the Soviet Union? In other words, is, this, is Putin trying to create a kind of zombie USSR, a reanimation of the dead body of an empire that died 30 years ago? or is something else going on? So um, I'd like to start then by talking about what was the USSR or the Soviet Union? So the Soviet Union was the name that the Bolsheviks or communists gave to a new country that they created out of the ashes of the Russian Empire. This empire of the Tsar had collapsed in 1917 in the midst of the First World War. World War I caused many changes around the globe, but one of the most significant was the collapse of Europe's three great empires. The Ottoman Empire, which collapsed into Turkey and then a number of other uh, independent nation states. The Habsburg or Austro-Hungarian Empire, which also collapsed into a number of independent nation states. And then the Russian Empire. The Bolsheviks stepped into a power vacuum created by the collapse of the empire and attempted to create the world's first socialist state a country where the interests of the working class and peasants would be put first, rather than the interests of the nobility and the capitalists. Of course, the Bolsheviks did more than simply step into a power vacuum. They helped to hasten the demise of the empire itself, um, leading, uh, participating in a revolution in February 1917 and then leading an insurrection to overthrow um, the government that emerged in its place later in the same year. After pulling Russia out of World War I unilaterally, they fought a bloody civil war and they reassembled the territories of the collapsed empire. So by 1922, they had put most of the empire back together through conquest. Now, there were many ways that this new empire was different from the, the old empire. Not least of which, of course, because most obviously the Bolsheviks claimed to be ruling in the name of the working class and the peasants. The old empire had served the interest of the nobility and of wealthy capitalists. But it's also particularly novel, this new state, in the way that uh, the Bolshevik rulers saw different national or ethnic groups and the way they sought to rule them in their new empire. The, the territory of the new Soviet Union was not only vast. I put up here a, an ethnographic map of um, of Russia, the Russian Empire from 1914. So you get just some sense of the diversity of this massive state. It was incredibly diverse in terms of language, in terms of culture, in terms of nationality, in terms of religion, in so many ways. There were, there were just a, considering nationalities or ethnicities, there was a dizzying array. And I'll just name some of the nationalities in this new Soviet Union. There were Armenians, there were Georgians, there were Azerbaijanis. Ukrainians, Belarusians, Poles, Jews, Kyrgyz, Kazakhs, Uzbeks, Turkmen, Tajiks, people of the Caucasus region like the Chechens, the Ingush, the Balkars, na many native groups in the north in Siberia. Um, and of course, it was also a religiously diverse empire with not just Orthodox uh, Christians, but also millions of Catholics and Jews and also large numbers of uh, Muslims and also uh, a substantial Buddhist population. So in the Russian Empire before the Bolsheviks, 
these minorities hadn't been treated very well, <laughs> to put it mildly. They were, not to, 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 to try to simplify a very complex picture, there were basically two trends in the way that national minorities were treated in the Russian Empire. The first was um, that they were generally treated as inferior uh, to Russians, as second-class citizens. Um, they were treated uh, often as backward or primitive, especially true of people of the peoples that uh, Russia conquered to the east and the south, particularly Muslims, um, whom Orthodox Russians felt were inferior. A second trend was assimilation. That is, some of the people who were, who were conquered by the Russian Empire were assimilated forcibly or otherwise into Russian language, Russian culture, and Russian religion. But the empire, it was neither possible nor really desirable for the empire to assimilate all of these people. So the Bolsheviks took, basically took control, you know, conquered this, this empire, and were faced with the same situation. What were they going to do with the incredible diversity that made up the empire? They knew they weren't going to, they, they had no intention of treating people the way the old empire had. They had to find a, a new policy and way to approach it. So they started, as in many things, with Marx. Now, Marx considered nationalism to be uh, a form of false consciousness. He basically said that, you know, the world was really made up of classes, of social classes. Um, and the world should really be made up of a single working class that knew no nations, knew no language, knew no, knew no national distinctions. Um, it was only the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, who convinced workers that they were French or they were Italian or some other nationality in order to divide them from each other, make them seem like they had more in common with the capitalists of their own nation than the, than the workers of the, of the other nations. So it was, for Marx, nationalism was a tool that um, capitalists used to rule over the working class. Marx believed, therefore, that when the workers' revolution took place, nationality would disappear. Eventually, everyone would speak the same language, have the same culture, et cetera, et cetera. And that would, there would be one single world proletarian culture. This is what the Bolsheviks believed largely before they took power. But then reality taught them otherwise. <laughs> uh, what happened after the collapse of the Russian Empire didn't mar match Marx's ideas at all. Not only had many nationalist movements sprung up across the empire, but these groups had actively fought against the Bolsheviks, seeing them as Russian imperialists, even though they claimed to not be. This was true, for example, in Ukraine, right? there was a, where there were a series of republics from 1918 to 1921 who fought um, against the Bolsheviks uh, very vociferously and eventually uh, were conquered um, from the West by Poland and from the East by, by the Bolsheviks, sort of snuffing out that, that moment of, uh, of um, Ukrainian nationhood. So the, Bolshevik move, the Bolsheviks defeated all these national movements by force eventually. Um, but then they had to figure out, okay, what do we do with this? What do we do with these people? Because the Bolsheviks didn't intend to rule by force alone. That is, they were happy to do so. The Bolsheviks were never shy about, about applying force, but they recognized that national separatism was dangerous and it could threaten to tear their empire apart. So that was really the first, the first realization of Bolshevik nationality's policy, that nationalism, even though they didn't really believe, they believed it was a false form of false consciousness, it was extremely dangerous because it could turn people against them. They also concluded that national consciousness must be an unavoidable historical phase that all peoples pass through on their way to a post-national international world uh, dominated by a common working class culture. So in other words, the Bolsheviks became to expect that nationalist awakenings would happen across the empire as more and more peoples became more advanced. As they advanced towards, um, towards communism, there would be nationalist movements uh, that was inevitable, but temporary. So nationalism was inevitable, but only a stage. Third, the Bolsheviks concluded that nationalism in the territories of the former Russian Empire was primarily a response to oppression by the Tsarist government. That is, the main reason why there were so many national independence movements after 1917 is that people saw the Bolsheviks as Russians, just like the old Tsarist government, and this was the reason why they were being repressed. So it, the, the argument went that if the, that the communist government could demonstrate to the people that they were not like the Tsarist government at all, 
that they would respect national differences, nationalism might cease to be a force tearing the country apart. So the question became, how could the Bolsheviks reconcile these three ideas about nationalism? That it was dangerous, that it was inevitable but temporary, uh, but also that it was primarily a response to Russian chauvinism or Russian nationalism. So in 1923, just after founding their new empire officially, they launched a, 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 the, what would become their official policy about nationalities that would more or less guide Soviet nationalities policy for the rest of the existence of the empire. It was totally original. Um, it was not like anything the world had ever seen before. The idea the Bolsheviks advanced was to, was to actually promote any form of nationhood and national consciousness that did not conflict with the idea of a strong centralized state that they were building. Any kind of nationalism, in other words, that didn't interfere with Bolshevik control of politics and economics and you know, a monopoly on force would be accepted. The forms of nationality considered to be acceptable were national territories, national languages, national elites, and national cultures. Note what's missing here national self-determination. <laughs> that is, the Bolsheviks never promised that these nationalities could decide their own fate and never promised that they could become independent. But they could have all other forms of nationhood. Now, for most nationalists, that's a deal breaker <laughs> because, of course, national self-determination is the most important part of that uh, for them. But nevertheless, this was the way that the Bolsheviks approached it. So to realize this vision of how some forms of nationalism could be actively incorporated into a new empire, the Bolsheviks began to take several concrete steps. First, they divided up the territory of the former Russian Empire into new territories that could be considered the national homelands of the various nationalities of the largest national groups within the empire. These territories were called republics, as in, you know, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, these are the republics. Before World War II, there were 11 of them. Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. After World War II, they, they, they conquered Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia and incorporated them as republics. And then they, they conquered the territory of what then became Moldova, which then became the, the 15th um, Republic. Now, some of these territories had existed as national units or provinces or, or even ideas, but many of these had not um, previously existed. So the Bolsheviks went through a process of drawing the borders. Where would the border be between these national republics that they were essentially creating, many of them for the first time? Now, the, con the, the process of drawing borders was not without controversy and conflict, um, but it's, in most, it's important that in most cases, the Russian part of this the Russian uh, Federation, um, as part of this union, gave up territory to the national units, uh, which is interesting. Um, fast forwarding ahead 70 years, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, these borders that were drawn mostly in the 1920s then became the borders of these independent states, um, precisely because they were there because that's how the Bolsheviks drew them up in the 1920s, which led to all kinds of unintended consequences. Now, of course, you know, not all peoples fit into these perfect little homelands, right? There were large pockets of people living outside these, these republics or territories, and the Bolsheviks had a solution to that. They created auton autonomous cultural and natural regions, regions within these republics um, to, so that where these national groups could be, could be represented. So, for example, there was a very large enclave of Armenians within the territory of the Azerbaijani Republic. So they created an, an autonomous region for those, for Armenians within Azerbaijan. Um, again, Russia had by far the largest number of these, um, autonomous regions. Um, there were 51 in total, I think, by, by 1939. Um, one scholar has likened these to like nesting dolls, like Russian nesting dolls, Matroshki, because essentially they were they were like one one within another. They 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 often originally they even extended down to the level of individual village, that could be uh, could be ethnically autonomous. So, setting borders was only one issue. There was also the issue of language and culture. Um, the Soviets recognized that each of these nationalities had to have a language and culture. Some of the 
nationalities did not have written languages, um, did not have formal grammars. Uh, so the Russians set about, this, the Bolsheviks set about giving them, giving them languages. They sent out ethnographers to go copy things down and essentially create, um, create alphabets, create you know, languages, grammars, uh, to represent people's oral cultures. A very imperialist project, I might note, right? Sending out eth ethnographers to do this. But nevertheless, the idea was that, um, you know, Uzbekistan needed a great national literature and also that also all Uzbeks needed to be literate in their own language. And the, the, the Soviets took this, this mission of, of making all of their people literate in, in their native languages extremely seriously. Um, in addition to these policies of creating borders um, and draw, sometimes creating languages and cultures, there was also the issue of promoting national elites. Um, the Bolsheviks recognized that um, if they didn't want to look imperialist, they better not be directly ruling these territories. They didn't, you didn't want to have Russians, Russian Bolsheviks ruling Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan. Instead, what they wanted was good communist Uzbeks and good communist Kazakhs running their own territories. So that, that essentially they wanted to make sure that each territory had its own, its own national elite. Um, so how did they do this? They practiced affirmative action. Um, before, before this is a concept in the United States, what they did was, was quite a lot like this. Basically what they did was they um, reserved positions in um, in higher education, in government, specifically for people who belong to those national or ethnic groups. And they practiced reverse discrimination against Russians, especially in higher education. So the entire higher, edu higher education establishment of the Russian Empire had been dominated by Russians, mostly, and a few other, a few other national groups. So what they did was they made it much harder for Russians to, to get into those um, those elite universities, and then they, they, they made it much easier for people who belong to these national minorities to get in, to, to, to forge national elites who would rule these territories. Um, in the sense, they wanted, to, they wanted there to be a form of self-government. <laughs> Although again, this is not <laughs> actual self-government in the sense that people have authority over what's going on in their territory, but that, like, but that, that, that the, part, the Communist Party and state elites in these territories should look, should look and talk and act like the people who are being ruled. And this would help um, prevent national um, problems with nationalities. This notion of the uh, um, affirmative action empire, by the way, um, was uh, promoted by the, his, invented by the historian Terry Martin. Um, now, I must say, so this was, this was the solution to the Bolshevik problem of empire. They created an empire that itself encouraged national differences rather than trying to destroy them, as empires usually did. There are caveats, of course, to this, and they're very important to keep in mind. First of all, active promotion of national languages, cultures, and elites is not, national, not promoting national self-determination, right? These, these peoples did not have the right to leave the union. They did not really have the right to govern themselves in any, in any meaningful way. Um, the central state kept very tight control over politics, over the economy, and over the coercive power of state, police, and military. And whenever these policies, these nationalities policies conflicted with overall state goals that had to do with politics and the economy and the military, they were more than, Bolsheviks were more than happy to override those, those national concerns. Second, um, the Bolsheviks also um, argued that whenever any national or ethnic group posed danger to the interests of the states, they were quite willing to brutally repress them. Um, such repression happened especially under Stalin. There were a whole series of ethnic deportations ethnic cleansing operations where members of an entire national group were packed up and put on trains and sent somewhere else um, to live out the rest of their lives and their children as well. Not, would, you would not be surprised to know that many people died during such operations, um, especially women and children and the elderly, um, especially in the, in, during the actual deportations and in the first couple of years before they were able to reestablish themselves where they were sent. Uh, so really, you know, Ethnic cleansing and the promotion of national languages, cultures, elites, and territories are really two sides of the same coin for the Bolsheviks. Third, 
Whereas the Bolsheviks initially had taken a very radical approach to Russian language, that Russian should not be the lingua franca of the empire, that Russian should be downplayed. They, they, they made a complete um, uh, about face in the late 1930s and Russia became the lingua franca of the empire. Um, Russian, nation, Russian national culture, the Russian people became the elder brother in the family of, of the Russian nation, so they began to have this kind of special status. So functionally speaking, this meant that, um, that members of national minorities in, in, the, in the Soviet Union were at least bilingual because they all spoke whatever their national language was, but they also spoke Russian because it was necessary. And many of them were trilingual or quadrilingual um, because that was necessary to, to live where they were. So if I can sum up very briefly the question, of, so what was the USSR, right? It was an empire created to avoid the risk of creating national separatism. They explicitly acknowledged and promoted national differences in some contexts at least in order to help maintain strong political and economic control over the new empire. It was an experiment of how to create and maintain an empire in the age of decolonization, in the age when all the other empires fell, right? It wasn't just the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Russian Empire, it was also the British Empire, right, um, that, that, that fell. Um, and so this was, a, this was a radical experiment to try to be able to maintain an empire in an age of radical decolonization. And it was largely successful right up, right up until the collapse in 1991. Not in the sense that Soviet subjects had any real freedom, right? But in the sense that um, creating this multinational empire largely kept the peace um, between, between nationalities in a way that has not been true since the Soviet Union collapsed over the last 30 years. So having spent a little time talking about what the Soviet Union was, I'd like to return to our second question, which is probably a more interesting question today. Is Russia's invasion of Ukraine an attempt to return to the Soviet Union and, rep and resurrect it as a zombie empire? Um, a lot of commentators have been throwing around this idea that you know, Putin is trying to recreate the Soviet Union. And it's not, it's not implausible. It's very plausible for, for important reasons. I mean, the USSR has only been gone for 30 years. Um, Putin, the majority of other leaders of post-Soviet Russia right now, are products of that system. Putin has publicly expressed um, on numerous occasions nostalgia for the Soviet Union. Um, a nostalgia, by the way, that is shared by many um, citizens of former Soviet states, mostly Russians, of course. <laughs> but, but that nostalgia is absolutely there. However, I would like to suggest strongly today that there are some compelling reasons why this war is not, in fact, the Soviet Union rising from the dead. Thinking both in terms of justifications that are given by, by Putin and the, the apparent goals of this conflict. First, if we look, take a look at the stated justifications, in quotes, right, for the invasion that have been uttered by Putin and other top Russian officials. One explanation that Putin has expounded upon at great length in numerous places is the idea that Ukraine has never really existed as an independent state and has always been dominated by Russia. It's nonsense. Um, but it suggests that Putin and his advisors are motivated by some kind of notion of Russian imperial greatness, right? Uh, which, is, which is not Soviet imperialism. That's Russian imperialism. These were different things. A second stated so-called justification for the war is the idea that it's necessary to protect Russian speakers in Ukraine, of which there are many, um, from so-called Ukrainian Nazis. Again, this is nonsense. There are lots of Nazis in Ukraine. There are lots of Nazis in Russia. <laughs> there are lots of Nazis in Western Europe. There are lots of Nazis in lots of places, right? But uh, the idea that 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 the, these Nazis threaten Russian speakers in Ukraine is, you know, completely, completely absurd. But again, it, what's important here is that Putin is arguing for this war and presenting it uh, exclusively as a way to protect the rights of Russian speakers in Ukraine. Right? Very different from a notion of the, this idea that, that justifying the war in terms of protecting Russians and Russian speakers is presenting the war through a purely Russian nationalist lens, which is very different from a Soviet nationalist 
lens, which a Soviet imperialist lens was problematic, of course, but it was always presented in terms of preserving peaceful and stable multinationalism. The stated goals of the war are not in any way consistent with the stated principles of USSR. Second, if we look at the, uh, the apparent goals of the war, which I will freely admit are very hard to divine, <laughs> um, it's, it's, we're still disentangling, and we'll, we'll, we will be disentangling for a long time, why exactly Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, and, and then again, this huge new invasion in 2022. But what is clear, though, is that it's not really consistent with the idea that Putin is trying to reestablish the Soviet Union. In this war, as in previous wars, Russia has generally not, an, not actually annexed new territories or joined, incorporated those territories into Russia. A big exception to this, of course, is Crimea, which I won't talk about right now, but we can certainly happy to talk about in the Q&A. But I, I think it's an outlier. Generally speaking, um, the, the, the strategy has not been direct conquest. It has, in fact, been to make use of puppet governments on contested territories to strengthen Russian influence and undermine the sovereignty of other former Soviet republics without actually um, annexing and or making these, these regions part of Russia. For example, if you have take Russia's war with Georgia in 2008, uh, the Russians didn't directly seize the territory of South Ossetia. They, set their, they sent their troops to support a puppet government um, to Maintain to you know to maintain the independence or, or create or establish the independence of South Ossetia. Um, instead, you know South Ossetia is not part of Russia. It is a semi-sovereign, quasi-sovereign state that is that is ostensibly part of Georgia, um, but it is it, it weakens right the sovereignty of Georgia because it has it has an ongoing conflict on its territory. The pattern was repeated in Donbass and Eastern Ukraine, the so-called People's Republic, uh, which is you know, of, of Donbass, which is a, you know, a puppet government for Putin, certainly, but again, not actually integrated into Russia, um, instead a quasi-sovereign state. Uh, Russia has a pattern of creating and maintaining frozen conflicts, as they have done in, in Georgia, in Ukraine, and also in, in Moldova. Why? Well, it's, you know, it's not entirely clear what the goal, long-term and short-term goals of these frozen conflicts are, but uh, it's a way to exert enormous influence on their neighbors without huge expense of actually administering new territories and also without upsetting the international order. Although again, <laughs> that Putin has obviously definitely upset the international order in the past six months. These frozen conflicts have played an enormous role in controlling the fates of, these, of Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova. The EU, until recently, would not allow any country with an ongoing conflict to join. Same goes for NATO, right? If you can, if you can have a war without end in a territory of one of the neighbors that you, that you don't want to join NATO or the EU, you effectively prevent them from doing so. Um, now, of course, that's changed. The EU has now changed that rule, and um, Ukraine and Moldova and possibly Georgia are on the path to joining the EU after the rules have changed. But again, the, 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 you know, the, the, the lack of direct control is, is, a, is a specific pattern. So to, to, to sum this up briefly, I think the, the answer to this question is, is, it seems the answer is no both in terms of stated justifications and in terms of apparent goals. Uh, the, you know, the invasion of Ukraine is not consistent with the idea of trying to, of trying to recreate the Soviet Union af, as it collapsed in 1991. The USSR is gone and it's clearly not coming back. Um, Putin's war in Ukraine is certainly an imperial war, but it's a war of a different kind of empire. So overall, what can I say by way of conclusion to today's talk? First, I think we have to be very, very careful about trying to frame current conflicts in terms of the past. Of course, it's vitally important that we trace how the legacies of the past continue to shape the world around us. Otherwise, why would we study history? But I think we need to be very careful about pat comparisons or stereotypes, taking them at face value. While it may be easy shorthand, 
to explain Russia's actions as an attempt to resurrect the USSR or to recreate the Russian Empire or to fight a new Cold War, it's really important to, to question how these comparisons hold up. As I've tried to argue today, the comparison to the Soviet Union doesn't, doesn't hold up particularly well. It, I think it's more useful to ask the question, uh, what about the USSR and the way that it collapsed 30 years ago can help explain the causes and the course and the outcomes of this and other wars in the post-Soviet space? I think there we can draw some, some very good conclusions. Finally, I think it's most important to remember that it's essential that historical explanations are not mistaken for justifications. Nothing in history is inevitable. All actions are contingent. You know, just because historical legacies help us to explain why something happens doesn't mean that human beings have no agency in, in, in these events, right? Putin and his supporters would like nothing more than for everyone to believe that the invasion of Ukraine was inevitable, that it was necessary, right? That it was an inevitable sort of a product of historical fo of some historical forces that they're conjuring. Instead, we have to remind the world that that it was the result of conscious choices and that those found responsible must be held accountable for their decisions and their consequences, especially for the tens of thousands of civilian deaths and for forcing millions to flee their homes. That's all I got for today. Thank you. Um, I'm more than happy to, I'd love to take any and all questions you might have. Thank you for being such an attentive audience. <laughs> So I think we're going to have a, a microphone circulated. Sorry. Any questions? So I'll, I can come around, give you the microphone, so everyone can hear you. Any takers? First of all, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you're aware if there's any extant information. Um, you mentioned that uh, some of the nationalist groups under the Soviets had specific, uh, it sounded like political or economic uh, grievances or, or issues, I guess, with being part of the larger whole of the Soviet Union. I'm wondering if you could speak to some of the specifics of, of those issues. Yeah, okay. Um so let me let me let me put it another way. I mean, I guess what you know, the Soviet Union was broken into national republics, but it was a single unified economic and political system. That is that, you know, um unlike most nation states, you know, products aren't made in one or that nothing's made in one place anymore anyway, but they, they, products weren't made in one place. You know, things were, you might have raw materials that come from one region, come from one republic and go to another republic to be manufactured. So it was a, it was a single kind of integrated system. And overall, you know, economic planning was always more important than respecting nationalities. That's, that's sort of what I'm, what, what I'm, what I'm getting at. But certainly, you know, whenever, if there, if, if any time when a republic, you know, tried to, um, assert more, um, more autonomy, like Georgia in the late 1950s after Stalin's death, um, you know, they were, they were brutally repressed by the center. Questions? I'm gonna put you on the spot. You said that uh, the outlier was Crimea and that you would address that at Q&A. A little bit of backstory, I'm actually, Second generation born in the US and my family left Crimea right before the Russian Revolution. So I'm actually here tracing my own history. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so, so you want me to talk about Crimea? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, so I mean, you know, Crimea for the Russians has a different story. You know, Crimea was given from, um, by Khrushchev to Ukraine by Russia, by the Soviet Union from the Russian Republic in 1954. So there is a, a there is a kind of Russian irredentist claim to that territory, um, but there's also a much you know much more uh, troublesome history of ethnic cleansing, right? I mean, uh, one of the reasons why that territory was given to Ukraine was so that it could be repopulated, be, because the Crimean Tatars, the people who had lived there for generations and centuries, had been deported entirely from that from that region, right? And um, and in fact, after the Russian invasion um, in 2014, um, many Crimean Tatars have been redeported. 
Um, they were, they were most national, most of the national, most of the groups that were deported under Stalin's national deportations were allowed to return to at least some form of their former territory. The Crimean Tatars were an exception. They were never allowed to come home. Um, and so that, that, that is a, that's a, that's a big part of that. I mean, I, Russia has, has, you know, military interests in Crimea because it has, it has, made, has maintained um, nuclear submarine bases. You know, even when it was Ukraine, that was a part of a deal worked out that Russia could continue to have, to have uh, territory there. And, and also, you know, it's, um, it's a relatively kind of self-contained landmass, so it, was, it may have seemed like an obvious prize to, to Putin. But it, yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question as to why that was integrated, why it was seen as a prize when, you know, Donbass and, and Luhansk were, have been left to be these sort of semi-independent republics. Anyone else? Maybe a history professor? Oh. Didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. Um, so my question relates to the territory or the, the um, Soviet republics that Russia acquires after World War II. Um, so most, you know, the, the eastern buffer zone. Do, does the Soviet Union, Soviet policies have to adopt the same tactic that they had to do with na national minorities in what had previously been Russian lands? Or do you find that nationalism was, you know, already so strong in these areas um, that, I mean, kind of, I guess, is the same policy extended. And then I also think to myself about um, how German, the, the East German um, state fits into that as well. So, yeah, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia are special cases. I mean, so they had been part of the Russian Empire, mostly, before 1917, but the Bolsheviks didn't reconquer them. So, and they did in 1939, 1940, and then they lost them again in the war, and then they reconquered them. Um, so they were always special cases, um, because precisely because they were integrated after the Second World War, um, and um, they were also there were very strong nationalist movements, um, national independence movements in those in those states that fought. You know, really, I mean, until 1949 at least. Uh, there was a very big military presence um, trying to clear out the nationalists in, in Latvia, Lithuania, and, and Estonia. So, um, so yeah, they they were they were certainly somewhat different um, cases. And you know, there's there's a reason why um, they were the first to become independent. <laughs> that you know, the rest of the union it took a while, but they were already you know, 19, 1989, 1990 declaring independence before the Soviet Union really collapsed. It, the, the whole question of satellite states like East Germany, that's like, a, yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole kind of other kettle of fish because th those were not, you know, those were not part of this, this uh, Soviet nationalities project because they were, they were specifically seen as part of an external empire. Uh, thank you for doing the talk, by the way. Um, I was wondering if, uh, you can go into a bit more of how the Soviet Union, when it dissolved, it avoided the ethnic conflicts that uh, Yugoslavia, which was part of its old empire, experienced when it collapsed. Yeah, okay. I mean, I mean, the short answer is that Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union were very different places. Um, you know, how did this, I mean, and to say that the Soviet Union totally avoided it would be inaccurate, because they were definitely, I mean, I probably over-exaggerated that. I mean, there, there, you know, there, there are, there were and are still ongoing some very serious conflicts um, over territory between you know, component states that were part of, of, of the Soviet Union. Um, I mean, I think part of it had to do with that Russia left voluntarily. <laughs> Russia declared itself independent. Um, you know, the Baltics were first, um, and then Ukraine, and then Russia around the same time. Um, now, I think very quickly many Russians regretted that decision or, or didn't think that, that the consequence of, having, of declaring themselves independent was having to give up the, em the empire. But, um, but that, that, that had a big part. That certainly had, had, a, lot to, had a lot to do with it. Um, so so it, 
I mean, really, it's miraculous that the collapse of the Soviet Union didn't have so, so much more violence. Um, and in many ways, what, one way of seeing, you know, post-Soviet conflict over the past 30 years is that essentially many of these conflicts that were avoided initially are now playing themselves out over over the just over a, a longer time frame. So like you said a few minutes ago, um, a lot of the high-ranking government officials grew up during the Soviet Union, and they're very influenced by it. And as other government officials come in, they're probably influencing them as well with the same ideals that they had growing up. What's to stop them from creating another one like this? I know you said that the war with Ukraine isn't really trying to revive it, but what's to stop it from changing like they're like oh you know what we're going to change while we're why we are invading and you know what this is what we're going to do now yeah that that's a great question you know why what's to keep them from changing their minds i mean my interpretation of russia's you know imperial actions over the past several years is that it's very improvisational they don't they're not really thinking through the consequences of what they're doing um it's pretty obvious that Putin overplayed his hand, <laughs> to put it mildly, with the invasion of Ukraine. He expected it to be over in three days, right? Um, here we are six months later. Uh, so yes, of course, it's possible that they changed their minds and, and that they're already revising their, revising their publicly stated goals. Um, uh, it's my suspicion that, that the goals are not particularly grand at all, um, that it has to do with um, you know, maintaining a, a dictatorship, uh, maintaining stability in the ruling elite, which means, you know, continuing to show um, the ability to win war, the ability to continue to throw its weight around in, with its neighbors. Um, but the, the, the really big difference, the big reason why, why is why this is not a revival of the Soviet Union, which uh, an element which I didn't really talk about today at all, is that, you know, these people are not socialists by any means, right? They, 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 you know, they, they love capitalism, right? That's the, that's the thing that's most important to them about the, about the way Russia is today. R Putin and the ruling elite are, you know, are incredibly wealthy in a way that had never have been possible in the Soviet Union. And they have no interest in it going back to that. They, you know, standard of living for them is much higher than anything they could have imagined. And so that's another big thing that's, that's, that's really preventing, um, the, the notion of a kind of of a kind of recreation of an empire is this this class element, which which we didn't really talk about, but it's it's really important. Any other questions? I think there was one up here. Yeah. Well, what is an explanation for the uh, Russian involvement in Afghanistan? Whew, okay, yeah. Well, a big part of it had to, well. <laughs> so, you know, there was a, a radical socialist government took power in Afghanistan and wanted to transform the country and, and, and faced a lot of opposition. Um, and part of the story is that, you know, the United States lured them in. Um, that there was a deliberate attempt to make to make it to to create the circumstance to make the circumstance in Afghanistan look like it was necessary but also good and helpful for the Soviets to intercede. And this is very well documented in uh, essentially to give the Russians their own the Soviets their own Vietnam. That was the that was the that was the goal. So, um, but you know it, you know it, but it was another it was a it was a you know a, a project of imperial hubris right of of, of being involved in the transformation of a foreign country into a, some kind of socialist state. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, it's a big, I mean, it's a, it's a big one. Um, Any more questions? All right, well, if there's no more questions, I think, oh, we have one right here. Um, did the Russians, the Russian speakers in the um, 
the territories in Ukraine, um, Georgia, Moldova, all those. Um, and they shared the same ideals as Russia. Were they, um, were they offered, were they ever offered Russian citizen, citizenship? Or do they have Russian citizenship? That's my question. Yeah. So, so, um, short answer, yes. I, I mean, I think, I, I think as far as I, what I've read, they are, they have been, the Russians have been handing out passports to those who want them in occupied, you know, Donbass and Luhansk. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, the, the, the picture of language and culture and nationality in Ukraine is extremely, is extraordinarily complex because, you know, you know, Kharkiv, right? This, 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 this city, um, the second largest city in Ukraine, which is in this region that the Ukrainians just, you know, liberated most of over the weekend. It's a Russian speaking city. Uh, and many people there, you know, you see videos of, you know, the videos which are probably, you know, legitimate videos of, of Ukrainian soldiers being greeted. They're being greeted in Russian, right? But, you know, Russian language doesn't, doesn't translate into Russian nationalism necessarily, right? You can be, I mean, it, it, this may change in Ukraine after the war, but it's, you know, it's entirely possible to be a proud Ukrainian and speak Russian. I mean, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, right? He's, he's a Russian speaker, he's a native Russian speaker. He had to learn Ukraine to get into politics. Um, so so it, it's, a very, it's a very complex picture of, of, of identity. I will say though that wars have their ways of making pe people feel very differently about um, language and identity. Um, there are a lot of Russian speakers in Ukraine who are, who are not speaking Russian anymore. Uh, precisely for this, precisely for this reason, that it, this of its association with with Russian imperialism. Um, to the people in those territories that do share the same ordeals as Russia, why won't they just simply move to Russia? <sighs> well, the other thing that's important to remember is that you know when the Soviet Union collapsed these borders that were between the national republics. These were not national, these were not international borders. You did not need to show your passport to cross between the territories of any of these states, which meant that there were lots of people who were, you know, Russian speaking, living throughout, living throughout the Soviet empire, which meant that there were lots of people on the border, you know, who, who might you know, consider themselves Russian, but live on the Ukraine, live live in Ukraine, and there was nothing weird about it. You know, to this, you know, people's families are live on both sides of the border. Be, uh, you know, for for this reason, and so we have to be very careful about projecting and confusing language and and national um, allegiance. Um, I didn't quote the language. I said Russian ordeals. So just people who share the same ordeals as Russia? Well, some of them are. I mean, people have left. <laughs> have certainly, certainly have left. Um, but you know, people also feel entitled to live where they want to live. So, um, you know, uh, we, we can't, you know, the, the, the flip side of, of you know, of, of saying that, well, if you like Russia, go back to Russia, is that, you know, the world is not a, Homogene, like we do not live in a world of homogeneous nation states, right? Um, there are plenty. There are always people who who live in, who live and are welcomed in democratic societies, who may consider themselves to be, you know, of of one nation or another, and it doesn't necessarily conflict, right, with them being loyal to that state. Um, I have another question. Um, There's quote war crimes in the regions on the east in Ukraine. I was, if there were war crimes, do you think Ukraine handled the situation um, correctly? Is there a correct way to handle a situation when your people are being subject to being massacred and civilians are being targeted? I'm not. I'm, I guess I'm not 
I'm not quite understanding your question. Um, there's like, I guess, war crimes on civili civilians, but um, I think I need to do a little more research on that. <laughs> I think the Ukrainians are doing exactly what you're supposed to do. They're inviting in international observers to, to see what's happened. They're documenting things and there will be trials. Hopefully people will be brought to justice. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that there's, and that, but there's also a limited amount that can be done when there's an active war going on. You know, I mean, the things that people are not talking about, right, is what, you know, over this past weekend, they just liberated, you know, at least 2,000 square kilometers of territory. We haven't yet started talking about what they're finding, right? They're finding, they're finding a lot of really grisly stuff. Um, and that will, and that's the unfortunate next sort of story that's probably going to be told in, 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 the, in the annals of this conflict. Anyway, thank you for your, for your questions. I think we're probably, are we at time or do we have? It's about, it seems. Oh yeah, so. Thank you, Dr. Berenberg, for such a wonderful lecture and for sharing so much of your knowledge with us. On behalf of Angelo State University's Dr. Arnaldo de Leon, Department of History, the Department of English and Modern Languages, ASU Russian Club, and ASU History Society, thank you so much for attending this evening's lecture. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to our next Russian Enrichment Program series lecture titled, Stand on the Right Side of History, Enterprises and Society in the Russia-Ukraine Russia War, which will be presented by Kharkov University professor, visiting professor at UT Austin, and Ukrainian historian Volodymyr Kulikov. This is scheduled for 6 p.m. on Tuesday, October 11th, and it will take place in Academic Building Room 135. If you are interested in this event and would like more information, it will also be listed on our university's website. I hope that all of you have learned something new about the USSR and Russia today that you can take away this evening. Thanks again for attending and have a wonderful night. Thank you.